Delta Life Fitness's accountability webinar. Today we have two amazing guest speakers, Georgie Fear and Josh Hillis, who are going to speak to us about how the top five nutrition habits can get us better results. Georgie Fear is a registered dietitian, board certified specialist in sports dietetics, and also co-owner of One by One Nutrition. She has studied nutritional science for 10 years and continues to educate herself daily. She has published peer-reviewed research and contributed to numerous textbooks. She speaks internationally at professional conferences on nutrition and coaching and has published two books. She currently writes a monthly column for Strength Matters magazine. She has also been published in many popular magazines and on prominent fitness sites, such as Runner's World, Shape, Prevention, Men's Fitness, and men's health. Josh Hillis is the author of Fat Loss Happens on Monday that he co-authored with the legendary speaker and author Dan John. It is the book on how to use habits to get the body you want. He studied at the National Academy of Sports Medicine. He contributed Fighter Workouts for Fat Loss chapter to the RKC Book of Strength and Conditioning. He is the author of several ebooks, and he also spoke at the Strength Matters Summit motivating summits and the elite fitness and performance summit training trainers on how to coach habit-based fat loss. He is also a question writer for the National Academy Sports Medicine CPT exams. He has 32,000 readers from over 150 countries that read his fitness blog. He has been quoted by the LA Times, Denver Post, and the US Today, and he is head coach at Power Hour Group Personal Training. Josh, uh, what can you add about this? Like, why is nutrition matters? Well, it, it's just one of those things where for most of the clients I get in the gym, um, you know, they, they want to get stronger and they want to get fitter, but really what they're coming to me for is they want to drop a dress size or they want to lose some inches or they want to drop, they want to drop some pounds. And, um, you know, we, we definitely get the, the workout side handled and the workout side is net necessary but not sufficient you know like by itself most people aren't most people aren't going to get all of the weight loss results that they're looking for just with their workouts they need to add in the nutrition component also and so yeah. um the, w the way we're going to talk about approaching it is actually for most people it's, it's like going to be the missing piece to actually getting the results they want so that they can they can succeed at both sides the workout side and at the food side it's so true like what is more frustrating than putting in all this time to exercise and then not seeing the results in your physical form that you want to see? Yeah, exactly. And and it's one of those things where I've I've gotten clients from that have said they're like, like yeah, you know, I've been working out, and I got stronger, and I can run farther or whatever, but none of that's showing up on the scale, and it's just because um, they weren't successful at making the kinds of food changes that they knew they needed to make. Yeah, definitely. Nutrition is the number one thing when it comes to changing weight. Um, increased body weight or body fat increases uh, a person's risk for you know, all sorts of maladies. We're not going to go into them, but you know, safe to say most people that are working with us or in attendance at this webinar probably have at least some interest in losing some weight. I like to point out that nutrition habits also matter because they can really increase quality of life for people who fall into the normal weight but unhappy kind of segment. Now, there's a lot of people out there that are unhappy with their bodies, they have a lot of stress when it comes to eating, or they feel like unless they count calories and weigh out all their food, they're not gonna be able to maintain that healthy body weight. And I view that as you know a problem in and of itself. And I love hearing when, when people say, you know, forming these nutrition habits that I learned from you and Josh, I don't stress about food anymore. I mean, I pay more attention to my husband and the conversation at dinner and not, oh my God, did I have three quarter cup of peas or did I have a full cup of peas? Cause I, I didn't check. So I, I love solving you know, that, that problem too. I, I think that's the, the um, I, I think a lot of people come to a habits based approach because like a, like a diet based approach just didn't work for them. But I think the thing that surprises people the most is that when they do start implementing um, the kinds of habits that we're going to talk about a, a few slides later um, is that they they enjoy their food more, they enjoy the rest of their life more, and they spend way less time thinking about food. Like it, it's um, 
mo- most of the clients we get, and, and a lot of the listeners can probably relate, like they've, they've spent a lot of time doing a lot of different kinds of diets that haven't gone well. And they ended up um, just spending so much time stressing about trying to get it right. And, um, and so I, I think it's cool when people can actually uh, let some of that go and build, build the kind of skills that are going to have them enjoy food more and enjoy their life more. Absolutely. So uh, the standard solution for weight loss, <clears throat> pardon me, is to go on a diet, you know, with or without exercise. Most people want to lose weight. The, the instant snap decision is, okay, so which diet am I going on? 80% of people want to do it themselves. They don't want to, you know, necessarily hire a registered dietitian or a trainer to work with them. They just, they just kind of want to find out some information and do it on their own. And most weight loss programs are based on the same few logics. Um, there's types that eliminate specific foods, such as you can't have dairy, you can't eat grains or gluten or any type of animal product. There's diets that limit the quantities of specific foods you can eat or the ratios of foods that you can eat. There's ones that make you stick to a really specific meal plan, such as, you know, you here we'll tell you what you eat for breakfast, what you eat for lunch, what you eat for dinner, and you eat it. Um, another type of angle that can be taken is to do meal replacements. And so that can be for all of the meals of the day, or it can be for certain meals of the day, like... I have a shake for breakfast, a shake for lunch, and a sensible dinner. Um, there's also a couple other methods out there that physically make it tougher for you to eat, such as people actually have their jaws wired shut. People have you know, gastric banding or various other types of weight loss surgeries to help them try and reduce their food intake in a physical sense. So most people in this in attending this webinar, I've probably done one or more of these. Um, most of my clients certainly have, and I, I'm sure Josh's have too. So we kind of assume this is everybody's experience and that what we're proposing as habits is really new and different. Um, yeah, and, and the biggest thing that jumps out to me about all of those um, ways of looking at it is just that they're so like zero to a hundred that there's, um, it's kind of, they all kind of are based around like change your entire life right now in, in perfectly, yeah. which tends to not work well. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Or it, it works really well, but it, it doesn't last very long. Right. Yeah. <laughs> totally. So, um, so do they work? You know, this, this whole dieting thing, if it worked, you know, maybe it's, it's worth it. So it, psychologically they definitely don't help anyone be happier so for that segment of the people that's already in normal weight and just wants to stress less a diet does not help um some people don't have any outcomes that are negative they don't you know have a worse mood or a worse relationship with food but some people definitely do a lot of people that i've worked with have said you know i didn't have an emotional relationship with food or i didn't binge eat or i didn't sneak eat uh, until i started dieting so it's it's unfortunate that um, even if it were successful for weight loss, it could have negative psychological outcomes. For weight change, it's, it's pretty possible to lose weight doing just about anything for six months. You can you know, stand on one foot while you eat and you'll, you'll manage to lose weight. But when we talk about weight maintenance after somebody's lost weight, that's where it starts to become pretty depressing. So uh, give or take a third to 40% of people who lose 10% of their body weight will regain it within a year about two thirds by the five year mark. And if you think 15 years into the future, 94% of people that have lost 10% of their body weight will have regained it. And that's, that kind of sucks because most of us are gonna live at least another 15 years. We would like to not you know, regain the pounds that we managed to lose. If you're thinking about you know, yourself as an individual and somebody forecasted to you like, okay, yes, you can go on a diet and here's your projected outcome. Within the first year, you'll lose 6% of your body weight. But in five and a half years, you'll have all of it back if you're the average person. That makes it sound like it might not be worth it. Anything to add to that, uh, Josh? No, just the, just the I, I think most of the listeners who've tried diets can probably just look at their own experience and just notice that like it, it's not just you that, that didn't 
that may have like tried to diet and gained most of it, some or most of it back. Like that's a pretty standard uh, result. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with you. It's not a thing. Um, real quick, I like to mention my client, Julie here. Now, Julie worked with me a couple years ago and she had done so many diets and she said, I'm great at dieting. I'm great at it. I lose weight, but then I put it back on and then I go on another diet and I lose it again. And so she had really, she, she is in my mind, the epitome of the yo-yo dieter. So when I think about the frustrations of losing and regaining, Julie comes to mind. So Julie was really terrified of losing weight again and going through the heartache of putting it back on. And she just really wanted this time to be different. And so as, as most people do as, when they worked through the nutrition habits, which we're, we're coming to shortly, um, you know, she started to lose weight. She realized that the process was slower, but one year after she started, she had lost 52 pounds, which is unbelievable that she lost 52 pounds in 52 weeks. It was like a, a choo-choo train of reliability. But uh, she checks in with me every few weeks. She just sends me an email and says, still got it off. Still got it off. So we're now past the two year mark. Julie has not regained weight for the first time in her life. And uh, it just makes me so happy to see those notes from Julie pop by. So and Josh, I, what are you quick? Yeah, oh, go ahead. No, no, that's it. <laughs> uh, well, I'm talking an awful lot, but uh, Josh, why don't you cover this slide? Okay. Um, so there's basically two ways to, to keep weight off, right? There's the control yourself with ever, forever method, which is everything you see in the media and magazines and hear from your friends and see on TV. And then there's the form healthy habits method. And it kind of goes back to what we were just talking about with, with frustration and, um, how the, it, it's not that the dieting method doesn't work. It's just that it is this like the, a constant struggle. It's, it is this like constant effort. Whereas the habit-based perspective is actually, um, we, we look at habits kind of like skills and they actually get it easier with more reps and they get easier over time. And that's the way that we're, everything we're going to present from here on out is going to be essentially about how to put your food, to, put your food plan together, put your habit plan together in a way that it gets easier with time. Excellent. Easier as it goes is, is fantastic. So um, you want to cover this one too? Yeah, sure. So standard nutrition coaching is kind of like we were talking about before, where you're, you're basically assuming you're going to change everything at once, right? You get a meal plan and it's like, they're all new meals, they're all new foods. You need to cook different things. You need to buy different things. It's, um, it's, it's a huge, huge change all at once. Um, where it says adherence starts high and then wanes. Typically people actually do well with diets in the really short term. It, it's just sort of that like white knuckling how long you can hold on. And, um, and so it, it's like, can you hold on for four weeks or eight weeks or, or whatever? But at some point it's going to crash because it was just too big a change. And then there's this constant fight about being as perfect as possible. And there's, there's sort of like no gray area and there's no room for play because really you have like, like these meal plan rules and you're either following the rules or not, or you have like meal plan meals and you're either eating those or not. There's no room for real life to come in for it to fit what you're actually going through and the ups and downs of schedule and family and all the kinds of things that happen in everyone's life. So at some point that at some point everyone's going to slip off perfection. And since there's no, there, since there's no like part of that that you can do, um, you, feel you just feel like you blew it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, Oh exactly. man, I'm not perfect. I blew it. I'll just start over perfect. from the top but perfect this time. Um, exactly. Um, and then food being tackled in isolation, again, doesn't take in your lifestyle into account. And it is that constant like on plan, off plan thing. Also, it just feels really like it's like, like being done to you or it's like put on you or it's like, I tell you what to do and you, and you do it. Um, Habit-based coaching is exactly the opposite of that in every way. You take on one habit at a time and you actually scale it in a way that it fits in your life, both, both your skill level and like your schedule and your stress level on a given week. So it's totally scalable 
and you can totally fit it into your life where you can get some legitimate practice and get in some reps and get better. And so we're always looking at how we're essentially looking at everything in the process as what's something you could do for the next 10 years or what's something you do for the rest of your life versus the diet way we're trying to hang on for like eight weeks, right? Or 12 weeks or whatever. And the short term too. Like if you have this crazy week at work, then like I wouldn't be confident that I could take on like this big, huge change, but I might be confident that I could do a smaller change. Exactly. And like, and that's, and that's going to happen, right? You're going to have those days where your kids have a bunch of projects or you've got overtime at work or like something is always going to come up. And if you can scale that, if you can scale the habit you're working on to a level that you can still succeed at it, even with the ebbing and flowing of life stress, then you can stay in the game. You can stay in the game and get more practice and still get better. And that comes back to the last point, which is where we look at it from the perspective of skill development. If you yeah. practice the habits, you'll get better. Definitely. I like, uh, it, I, like, I like the skill development part because it enables us to be a beginner again. Like, okay, if I haven't practiced, you know, doing other stuff with my emotions instead of eating, well, of course I'm low skill. Of course it's challenging, but then I'll, I'll get better as I keep practicing it. So I think it, it kind of frees us from the obligation to feel like we have to be good at this off the bat. Right. Which is, which is, which is huge. It's, it's really, really, really cool to be able to set up a game you can win for the next week and then win at it and then just stack wins over and over again. Totally. So uh, I think we already said some of the stuff on, on the practice and skill development approach. Um, These are, these are things that I recommend people incorporate into their own, the stuff in quotes. I recommend people incorporate this into your own internal dialogue. Like it's just practice. It's just practice. This is not like the, the lunch of my life. It's just practice, you know, <laughs> just, <laughs> just going to keep going. You know? um, it allows for errors, like, whoops, yeah. I ate my body weight in M&Ms. Okay, that's what practice is for. You know, next time I go to the, the movies, I'm going to get something else. So um, it's totally okay to make mistakes, and it, it doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. It's just, you know, it's how you learn. Um, we love to keep turning people's attention back to the process rather than the outcomes because you know, the honest truth is you have to change a number of habits to see weight loss start happening for many people and sometimes you'll get better in in the process like i'll get better at eating vegetables i'll get better at packing my lunch each day but it's not always going to show up on the scale the scale is like kind of the slow dumb kid in class or it doesn't always catch on right away so if we can focus on the process and say hey I practiced, I invested in myself, I, you know, I fed myself well, then we can get those rewards without it being dependent on like, did I lose a pound this week or not? Well, and, and the, the, the thing to, that, that I, don't, I don't want people to, to um, I, I want people to connect the dots on that, that, that actually the process is, is the only way to sustainable weight loss. Like working on the skill of eating more vegetables and working on all of the skills around that like shopping and cooking and planning uh, like like the skills are, are literally what fat loss is and um, and so even even if it can occur like it's slower in the short term it's faster in the long term because it actually sticks right if, if you look at the big problem with it with a diet mentality is you're trying to shoehorn this whole new food plan into your life without having really built any of the skills. And that's why it always falls apart. And so it, it, um, Can I just say, I love that you used the word shoehorn there because that's perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. So I I just want to point out that it act like it may feel slower in the very, very, very short term but it's actually faster in the long term and maybe it's actually the only way in the long term. And I think on some level people kind of get that like there's, there's a lot of skills involved in nutrition and fat loss and building them is what's actually going to get them where they want to go. Right. And it gets easier and 
easier over time, just like you said earlier. I love that when we do the, the habit-based thing, there's no transition between, you know, fat loss and maintenance at the end. It's kind of yeah. like you just, you don't have to have that, that, you know, which can be daunting for people like Julie, um, that line of like, okay, now I just want to maintain it. What do I do now? It's like, you just keep doing what you did. Just keep doing your habits. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I always love to point out that, you know, going on a diet takes a lot of time. As Josh said, you got to cook differently and shop differently and figure out what the heck they mean when they say this in the cookbook. Um, but if we're talking habits, it doesn't take any more time. You're already making time to eat, right? And right. You're, you're gonna you're gonna eat more than a thousand meals in the 365 day period, so you you've already got it scheduled. Might as well practice. All right. So by now everyone's like, what are these habits you're talking about? Tell us the habits. <laughs> so what we have here these are evidence supported fat loss habits, and what I mean by evidence supported is that we've got really robust scientific data on them. So um, there's certainly other things that are purported or theorized or sold as fat loss habits, um, but these are, are just, um, these are some of the ones that have the most scientific rigor to them, whereas certain other ones such as, uh, let's say only eating organic food or only eating gluten-free food or what have you, um, different nutrient combining or timing, they don't have a really strong evidence base. So, you know, uh, we try and deter people from wasting their time on things that aren't shown to work. Um, let's see. So there's probably nothing that surprises too many people on here. This is, you know, most people are relieved to say, hey, you know, I kind of know this stuff. You know, um, eating more vegetables is probably a great idea. Exercising. If somebody belongs to Delta Life, they've already started to prioritize, uh, you know, introducing that regular exercise into their routine. Um, if there's anything on here that does surprise people, I often point out the first two bullets. Uh, eating meals without snacking. You know, I think everyone's at least heard, if not tried, that we should, should in air quotes, be eating five or six or every three hours, um, you know, five or six times a day. And when we look at the research, like what actually changes when you eat more frequently? Calorie intake goes up when you increase meal frequency. So if you have you know, an aging parent or somebody that's losing weight and you wanna beef up their calorie intake and help them keep some weight on so they don't waste away, absolutely. You wanna feed them as frequently during the day as you can. However, for somebody that's trying to lose fat, it's actually less favorable to eat five or six times a day. That doesn't necessarily mean that you wanna go as few as possible because there's something to be lost. If you go down to eating only once per day or twice per day, it tends to also favor, you know, not getting into the calorie deficit because it becomes incredibly stressful. I would be in a terrible mood if you only let me eat once or twice per day. <laughs> um, but it seems that we get the most satiety from our food and can attain the best nutrient balance to manage our appetites if we eat about three or four times a day. So for most people, you know, Josh and I will often say it as eat meals, not snacks. So trying to clear up the space between your meals to not take in calories, but just eat your meals. And I love that because I was a, a, a former frequent meal eater and my meals had to be really, really small. And I got kind of frustrated at eating three or 400 calories at a time. And I felt like a real adult for the first time in a decade when I could eat a whole entree. <laughs> <laughs> what can you add, Josh? Um, well, I mean, what, what you said right there is, is super huge. I mean, like you spread it out that far and the meals get al almost non-existent, but I, I just want to throw out there that this is, this can be an absolutely game changing habit for people because you, I mean, if, if you take it just as like eating satisfying meals at regular meal times, it like, that's, that's pretty normal and pretty doable. And then we get to deal with all the reasons that you're snacking. And people find all kinds of cool things about their snacks. They might find out that they're snacking because that's the only time they give themselves a break at work, or they might snap, or they might snack because they're stressed out, or because they're feeling bad, or, um, or so sometimes even they have too long a gap between meals, or uh, or it could just be habit, or or whatever. There, 
there's a million reasons people can be snacking. What's cool is when you start playing the game of not snacking between meals and just having satisfying meals, you get to you, you get to you get to actually handle that. You get to look at like what else could I do to manage stress or what else oh, yeah. can I do for a break at work? It's That's, it's yeah. really cool. Everybody's self care routine levels up like a million levels yeah. when we stop snacking because it's like, oh, that snacking was a crutch for me not sleeping enough or that, that snacking was a crutch for me not managing my stress or not managing my time or not managing my relationships. And so, yeah, it's, it's a huge, huge, there's like 16 hidden benefits to trying to stop snacking. <laughs> um, let's see if there's anything else on here that I want to talk about specifically. I think these are, these are all pretty self-explanatory. So these are all great ideas. Um, we're not going to say, okay, do all of these tomorrow. You know, as, as we mentioned, the important thing is choosing one at a time. So we're going to come back to talking about specific habits. And by now, if you're going, I'm, I'm in, just give me a habit, Georgie and Josh, I, I want my habit. <laughs> well, we're going to come back and give you, you know, I think four or five to pick from that are really great starting points. Because some of those you know, you don't want to spin your wheels and, and work on a really small point before you do one of the bigger picture things. So more than what, we want to really drill home that the how is the most important thing here. One habit at a time. It, it can be tempting to do more, but, you know, curb your enthusiasm and try and keep yourself focused on one. When you put all of your focus into a single behavior, you can achieve it with a much higher consistency than if you split your focus between two behaviors. And the more consistently you can do the habit, the, the easier it's going to become, and the faster it kind of passes down from the difficult stage to the easy stage, and from the easy stage into the automatic stage. And it's great when all the things you need to do to maintain your lean body happen without you even noticing. Yeah, um, if, if, if you can have the courage and the discipline to just work on one habit at a time and really integrate it into your life, then you can actually that that's where you actually get, get to a point where where these habits start to become uh, where, where you start to actually get to see what you need to deal with and and learn from the habit in a way like learn about the habit and learn about yourself in a way that will have this fit into your lifestyle long term and yeah I, yeah do you have um you have a couple of questions i just want to get these out before we kept uh, going oh, cool um, based on what you're talking about. Um, so what do you guys recommend as, um, so far as the fourth meal time? I know it's not Taco Bell. So breakfast and then lunch and dinner. And that's from Jessica Cherry. Sure, I can take um, that one. Um, so for most people, if we start with like, okay, breakfast, lunch, dinner, we see if that works. If there's a really long gap, people will find like, okay, I, I want to put something in the middle there. And it's natural for the next question to be like, but isn't that a snack? <laughs> so I don't really, it's not as if, you know, you eat, I don't know, an apple and cheese and you call it a snack. It's somehow more evil than if you had an apple and cheese and called it a meal. It's, it's not about the name. It's more about um, getting all of your calories into three or four eating occasions, regardless of what you call them. So feed yourself <laughs> three or four times a day. So often I'll suggest people start with the basics of three meals and then figure out if there's too much space between lunch and dinner because somebody has lunch at noon and dinner's not until 8 p.m. Yeah, it's probably smart to plan a feeding in the middle of the afternoon so that you can bridge that gap without you know, chewing your arm off. Also, some people find that if they have an early dinner that they want to have you know, something to eat before bed. So we kind of figure breakfast, lunch, dinner, evening. Um, so it doesn't really matter what you call it, um, snack or meal. We just kind of use the opportunity that if it fits someone's life better to have a fourth meal somewhere that we can put it in there. Some of my athletes that exercise first thing in the morning will, will have something small before their workout because it leads to higher quality training. And then they'll kind of do their full breakfast afterward and lunch and dinner. How about you, Josh? What do you, what do your guys do? Same, same thing. It's, it's one of those things where if, if you've got a long gap between meals, you, you actually need food and, and that's, um, that's totally okay. I, I, I don't want people to be starving for like seven hour stretches or anything like that. The whole point of the habit to me is to generate awareness 
about all of the little things we eat mindlessly or little things that we eat for other for other reasons other than hunger. And so um, and so that's 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 the way I approach that also. Yeah, well, most people, if they're if they're planning an, an, an apple and cheese, excuse my earlier example, uh, in the middle of the afternoon because they're hungry, that's not so much an issue. You know, the more troublesome habit is the grazing on things that we're not aware of, the eating the, the crust from the kid's sandwich, uh, walking by the, the fridge can, and grab, what the, you the, the candy, candy dish? Jar. Candy jar, candy jar at work, the yeah, the cupcakes because it's somebody's birthday, um, the yeah. samples at Costco. Just the, yeah, the, the grays, the grays. Um, yeah, and workplaces are often the tough spots for that. Um, so tracking the habits. Some people will say, "Can I just do it without keeping track?" I'm not much of a record keeper. You you can, but I don't recommend it because if you just try and keep track. We often don't have accurate data. We either feel like I'm trying so hard, I must be doing it most days, or we miss it and we feel like we're doing terribly. But if you had tracked it, you'd see, wow, you actually did it 75, 85% of the time. So I highly recommend tracking it. It can keep some of the emotions at bay if we're feeling uh, particularly you know, uh, negative or overly positive and confident about our progress. Uh, the third one here is really, really crucial. We want to scale each habit to make it just right. And the snacking habit is, it's huge. You know, there's a lot of people out there that may have like their, their mouth wide open, like I could never do that. Please don't tell me to stop snacking. Um, and that was me. And that's a lot of my clients. Um, a lot of the readers of my book will say that's the hardest habit for them. It's the first one in the book. Um, and so we just scale it like, okay, can you make it from breakfast to lunch without snacking? Forget the rest of the day. Let's just isolate your practice time. For people, we've, we've even shrunk it smaller than that to be, can you not snack for one hour after breakfast? So eat your breakfast, decide when your hour starts, and then just don't eat for one hour. And you know, it's an easier, smaller thing to get used to. And then we can, once we have that experience, we can look at, okay, let's see what happens if we go for two hours and three hours and slightly different situations. And, and that's how you, you adjust your skills. You, know, you start with training wheels on. The, the thing about that is that if if you think about it like all the stuff you do in the gym, it's it's totally the same. You you don't go in the gym and start busting out pull ups and you know squatting three hundred pounds your your first day. You start with where you're at. You know you might start squatting with a fifteen pound kettlebell and 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 you work up. We do the exact same thing with with food habits, and it's it's less about getting to some perfect optimal version of the habit and more about getting your reps in and you know just just like in the gym if you get your reps in and you keep practicing uh, like your squat you get stronger you get better you can do more reps you can do more weight it feels better on your joints you can get deeper like like all those things come just with getting some practice in so it doesn't matter as much like it doesn't matter where you start it just matters that you get some practice yeah, it's um, tough to not it, get better if you keep practicing. It, it looks like we have a couple more questions. Yeah, yeah you have a couple. Um, Jessica asks, I keep getting told that I don't need to eat so close to bedtime because your body isn't burning as much fat then. So is there a good time to shoot for dinner um, dinner time? And does it really make a difference? Makes no difference. No difference. Yeah, if you're, if you're hungry, it's time to eat. It doesn't matter if it's 2 a.m., 2 p.m., midnight. Um, if you're not hungry, you don't need food, regardless of you know <laughs> the time. So um, yeah, I, I don't worry about it. I I eat dinner at eight o'clock every night, um, and yeah, I, I don't think twice about it. Um, the reason that sometimes it, it helps people to curtail their evening eating is because that's often the time when people are tired and fatigued and maybe stressed from the day, and so they're eating for non-hunger driven e uh, reasons. It's, it's also common, if we're gonna have something to eat at 10 o'clock at night, it's more likely to be ice cream than carrots. So sometimes it's, it's helpful in an indirect way to curb that evening eating. But if that, if that works for your schedule and that's when you're hungry, there's absolutely nobody that should, uh, no need to stop just because it's a certain hour of the day. And and I and I just want to point out, like uh, I that's that's a super 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 common myth. 
it, it doesn't surprise me at all that a bunch of people have been telling you that, um, Jessica. And so don't uh, don't feel bad. That's really common. It's just unnecessary. Yay. Um, <laughs> what are some more filling um, snack type meals? Being pregnant, I'm either sick or starving. And it seems um, so snacks have kept me going. What are items I can plan ahead to fill me up for longer periods? Sure, sure. So one like really, really important thing is that when someone's pregnant, the game changes. Like, as I, I hope we're all aware, when someone's pregnant, we don't want to be losing fat. So when I have, and, and I do have clients that become pregnant and are pregnant at this moment. And so we adjust the habits because it's more about good nutrition and having a healthy relationship with food and taking in an appropriate amount of nutrients to have a healthy weight gain that's not excessive and also to not you know, stress and, and to minimize the, the unpleasant gastrointestinal <laughs> impacts of being pregnant. So um, while I insert the disclaimer here that this isn't medical advice, <laughs> uh, it is really common to need to eat more than three or four times for a woman that's pregnant, and that's totally okay and totally encouraged. So with regard to meal timing, I usually recommend waiting until you're hungry and then eating, and then waiting until you're hungry again. So don't worry about the total number of times. We're just going for body-led signals. In terms of what can help keep you satisfied for a while, I would aim for, uh, you know, small, for each time you eat to try and have something with carbohydrates, something with fat, and something with protein. And so that way you're getting, um, you know, I get what we think of as a balanced meal, but it doesn't have to be super complicated. Um, you don't have to get out pots and pans and, and cook every time you want to eat. One really easy way to do it is to pair uh, a fruit and a cheese or a fruit and nuts, because both of those are going to kind of give you the carbs, fat, and protein. Uh, another one that some of my pregnant ladies have done is make um, peanut butter sandwiches, and they'll eat like half the peanut butter sandwich or a quarter of the peanut butter sandwich and, and some low fat or skim milk. And that's a nice combination and you can make one and get to it at any point during the day. Um, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily go downhill if it's not refrigerated. So yeah, peanut butter sandwiches on whole wheat bread with skim milk uh, and fruit and nuts and fruit and cheese are pretty popular ones. Any other kind of filling, easy snack combos that you can think of, Josh? No, yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. That's super, super, super awesome. Cool. Hopefully that was helpful and good luck with your pregnancy. Um, the next one we have is from um, Daniela. For someone who exercises at least five to seven hours a week and has pretty solid eating habits, eating three to five times a day, um, complete meals, but has stopped seeing change, what would be the next step? Awesome. First of all, like so great that you have consistent exercise habits. Um, and that you, if you're not seeing progress, what I usually recommend is to um, – kind of dial in how much you're eating at each meal. So we talk about it in various languages. So one is eating just enough or getting a feel for when you're satisfied. So that's one that, that Josh and I probably spent, I don't know, I, I spend probably 50% of my time on that one habit. <laughs> I don't know about you, Josh. Do you spend a lot of time on that one? Um, I sort of feel like about half the habits I do are um, – pieces of that you know like yeah. like like fit, fit into that in different ways you know so like some like habits like eating slowly is to me like an eating just enough habit eating without eating with uh without distractions is an eating just enough habit um eating carbs last is is like another way to look at eating just enough so probably yeah i, I definitely spend a lot of time on eating just enough kinds of habits or, or yeah. stopping with satisfied so overall quantity in various ways. And then I'll, I'll throw out there that I've, I've had other clients that were like, uh, I've, I've had some clients do really well with the eating just enough perspective. And I've had other clients do really well with um, coming at it from like a, like a planning perspective or like a portion size perspective. And so you could look at it from the other way, like how much food am I putting on my plate? And am I eating, you know, like just, just getting real about, am I basically eating, you know, a portion and a half of everything instead of a portion that, that kind of thing can be really useful to take a look at. Yeah. The, the other things that can sneak in there are the low nutrition foods, like 
the wine, the chocolate, the French fries. Um, you know, sometimes we feel entitled to have them, but entitled or not, um, they still have calories. So sometimes when people start to become more aware of how many calories they're getting from those foods, it's a bit of an eye opener. And the good news is we never have to cut them out completely. We just look at the frequency and portion size to figure out how much can get them into a calorie deficit. Uh, and then I would say the weekend trap. Sometimes people do, you know, really wonderfully at healthy habits and, you know, they get their energy intake where it needs to be Monday through Friday. And then in two days, they have enough energy excess that they don't, they kind of undo it. And then so at the end of the week, they're in a calorie balance. Um, Josh, you're the, the best at explaining Goldilocksing. <laughs> so, what do we mean by Goldilocksing? Goldilocksing is is absolutely the jam when it comes to habits, and it and we've been we've been talking about it a little bit all already. It's the idea that it's just like the three bears, right? Um, you know, it's like this porridge is too hot, this porridge is too cold, but this porridge is just right. We want to do the same thing with habits. In in general, people tend to to overestimate their ability level on on habits. They'll take on way too much. Um, and then, and then basically they'll get crushed and, and, um, feel like they failed. Um, on the flip side, sometimes people have maybe read about, uh, like, uh, lowest, um, minimum, um, minimum effective dose and maybe they try on too little and then they, and then they don't feel like they got enough challenge. We're looking for just the right amount of scale or frequency of a habit to where you're getting a little bit of a challenge, but you're 90% confident you can win at it that week. And that's a really good way to look at your habit plan, right? So from like a, like a, I'll, I'll just jump into the examples. So if, um, if you're going from eating vegetables once a day to bumping to eating vegetables two or three times a day, um, that could be, something you could look at that and say like okay eating vegetables at three meals a day i'm about 50 percent confident i could do that so you know that would be too hard right You're, you'd be setting yourself up to fail but if you're like you know what two meals a day i'm i'm 90 confident i could do that that would be an excellently goldilocks habit and um and that's that's what we're going for we're going for this this level of um we're, we're trying to have you set you up to win, right? Because yeah. you're going to get practice either way, but the practice feels so much better and you build so much more momentum when you, uh, like, when you do what you said, right? Yeah, when you're having success, it's like, all right, I can do this. <laughs> and the thing is, kind of like what I was saying before about squats, it doesn't matter where you start. You just need to get reps in. So, so again, if, if you should be squatting a 25 pound kettlebell, you don't go grab the 70 pound kettlebell just because you feel like you're supposed to, or you, or something like that. You grab the one that's the right amount. And so think about your habits in exactly the same way. Start and then you can always Goldilocks up if you do well. You can always stack more challenge on top of wins, but um, we, but we definitely, we want to be stacking wins. Cool. Well done. Love how you explain that. that. <laughs> no, that was awesome. That was awesome. So if everybody's thinking like, okay, I think, I think I can do this. I think I can do this. So how exactly does somebody get started with this? So the first thing is to pick a habit. And so we're going to give you five great options and any of these would be a, a uh, a great one. There's no right or wrong habit. These are all healthy and they, they generally benefit everybody. You want to Goldilocks it to it's just right. So you're 90% 90 90 confident that you could do this. Um, you want to pick a tracking method. There's no real, um, there's no one way to keep track. I have people that use apps on their phone or Google spreadsheets, good old pen and paper. Um, there's there's a million different tracking methods. It, the general idea is just to keep track of how many days you're doing your habit. Um, set your expectations. It's important to remember, okay, I'm not going for perfection. I'm just going for progress and I'm just going to keep practicing this. There's not going to be an X every single day for the next two weeks, but I'm going to 
hopefully get X's in most of the boxes. And then it's just going practicing. So just making sure that you, if you're worried about forgetting that you have some sort of trigger in place, an alarm on your phone that goes off at you know, mealtime could help you remember, hey, we're trying to stop when we're satisfied. That can, that can go a long way to reminding you of what your, goal are, your goals are. Um, and when it's feeling easy and it's taking considerably less effort, then you can start looking at, okay, what's my next habit going to be? So Josh and I came up with these five great places to start. So the, we've already talked about most of these already. So eating three or four times a day without bites in between, Again, that's the end goal. You can totally scale it or Goldilocks it to yourself to say, okay, I'm just going to try no bites between, you know, X and Y time. Journaling what you eat for awareness. Uh, journaling is a first habit in Josh's book. And, and by the time I read it, I was like, man, I need to do more journaling with my clients because it's, it's such a great way of, of building awareness. And I'm, I'm a reformed calorie counter who who used to really have an emotional roller coaster by the number of calories that I had tallied up that day and compared to that experience just journaling what I ate and sometimes how I felt about it um, I'll have clients do that and instead of judging themselves it's easier to just observe oh wow I didn't realize I eat this five times a day or I didn't realize that my breakfast is really small my lunch is medium and my dinner's huge every day. So when we just start journaling to observe, we can learn a lot more and it can teach us things to iron out in future habits. But for the first habit, a great one is I'm just going to write down what I eat. Um, try to feel hungry before you eat. For fat loss, a nice recommended amount of hunger is you want to be hungry for 30 to 60 minutes before you eat. So there's no need to really go longer than that. We don't want you to be lying awake, staring at the ceiling, you know, hours on hours of hunger, like curses, Georgie and Josh, I hate you both. <laughs> you know, a, a little hunger is a healthy signal. A lot of hunger is not necessary. So just as we want people to not eat when they're not hungry and look for what their other needs are, you know, a commitment to say, okay, I'm going to wait until I feel hungry before I eat. Um, can it, Sometimes it's the one thing that people haven't tried for weight loss and it's it's immensely effective even though it's very simple um, i have a Stop. question for you actually about that um great our women um they have a member who um says they can truly go all day without feeling that hunger cue um so say she will eat in the morning out of knowing the importance of breakfast and then she could literally go all day long without food have you um come across this and what are your recommendations for people who truly do not feel hunger cues yeah, I uh, I do come across that. Josh, how about you? Um, yeah, in in that in that so okay so the, there's there's so many different things that could be. Um, in general, I would probably have that person probably not start with that habit. Um, I would probably start them with maybe like eating three four three or four times a day without bites in between, and see if maybe they were grazing on other things during the day. Or, um, or I might even start with, actually, I would probably start them right there, it, exactly. And just see what happens and see what they notice and what they learn about themselves and eating while they're doing it. Um, yeah, that would be my perspective. Yeah, I totally agree with Josh on, I wouldn't start them with that habit if it's, if it's just seeming like not a good fit at that moment. Um, yeah, either planning out the three or four meals, because for someone that doesn't it's really common for people to have lost touch with their hunger signals or to physically have you know, kind of dulled them over time. Um, I've done a lot of work in the past with eating disorders and many people that have been through an eating disorder of some form, they have next to no hunger signals or they feel hungry constantly. So we have to do a fair bit of work to kind of get those signals back operating. The good news is they always come back. It's just a matter of getting uh, a normal meal timing going and getting the appropriate space between them. Sometimes, it, and of course, I can't know what's going on with this um, this this individual because I want to ask you like 85 more questions. But <laughs> some things to look out for that I've seen in, in people that say they can go all day without eating. Um, sometimes they have a very high stress job, and the the kind of 
cortisol dump that's <laughs> that's going on uh, during the day and the sympathetic nervous system acting up can mask your hunger and then it comes raging back at night when you finally get home. So that's something that, that can be going on. Um, I'm a lover of the coffee and I'm also aware that it's effective as an appetite suppressant. So sometimes people that say they're not uh, hungry all day because they're drinking a lot of coffee um, and with or without the cream and sugar, because even enough black coffee will kill your appetite, um, even if it's not, you know, supplying a lot of calories from cream and sugar. Um, other things that can happen can be medication related, and that's obviously beyond the scope of this webinar, but it's never a bad idea to ask your pharmacist or your doctor if your um, appetite could be a bit wonky from medications that you're taking. Um, and then lastly, look, looking at what someone's eating at night because if somebody is having a large calorie intake at night, it's kind of natural to not have an appetite in the morning. And so it can become a bit of a perpetuating cycle where the calories are, are predominantly consumed in that evening time slot and, and your body kind of learns to not secrete ghrelin and other hormones during the day because it's in the pattern of expecting that, that large evening meal. So if we start by reducing that evening meal then the morning appetite starts to come back so hopefully that was that was helpful at least in giving you some ideas again um with the timing um we have another question about um she gets up at six in the morning she doesn't feel hungry until noon is that okay to wait till she can eat her first meal then everything's okay with nutrition <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone's ever asked me anything and been like, is this okay? And I've been like, no, <laughs> it's all okay. <laughs> um, there's, you know, drawbacks and benefits to different things. Um, research does indicate that if we eat within an hour of waking, we will have better appetite management all day. Um, so I usually do recommend to my clients, if they're open to it, to try and eat a breakfast anyway, and then wait for hunger for their all of their subsequent meals. So first thing in the morning, eat one anyway, because it's demonstrated to help us have uh, better outcomes and, and it's correlated with better weight loss success to eat breakfast. So yeah, I would say, you know, lesser of two evils, I would rather than skip breakfast, I would just eat and then use hunger to cue you when it's time to eat your next meal. What would you say, Josh? And, and I'd say, I'd, I'd say just having having dozens of clients that have been that same position um, after they started eating breakfast, they started getting hungry for breakfast, yeah. you know, like give it two or three weeks and, and all of a sudden you're hungry at breakfast time. Now, yeah. um, a concern that one of our members has is they've heard that if you go too long without eating, your me metabolism slows down. So what is that? What do you feel about that? <laughs> That's, that's, it's, that's super, super, super common. It's a, it's another kind of like bro science kind of thing that's, that's talked about all the time, everywhere, all the time. Um, and so I'm not surprised that you heard that. Um, but it also doesn't matter. Um, do you, um, do, do you want to cover, like, like we kind of covered that a little bit on the, on the three to four meals thing. Um, but do you have anything else? Say about why, Georgie? Uh, well, you kind of summed it up by like, it's just not true. <laughs> like, it's not too much to say. It's like, I'm sorry, but no. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't increase your metabolism to eat more frequently, and it doesn't decrease your metabolism to eat less frequently. Um, there is metabolic adaptation to weight loss which is very different, but some people will say like, oh, my, my metabolism is slower or I'm in starvation mode. Uh, and, and that your, your, sorry, your body does adapt to weight loss because the reduction in fat, fat mass, like the actual shrinkage of your fat depots, um, causes a reduction in the amount of leptin, which is a hormone, you know, circulating around in your body. And leptin chats with your brain and lets it know how, how fluffy you're feeling. <laughs> and so when, when the leptin level comes down and your brain's like, oh, wait, we're getting rid of some of those fats, fat mass, fat cells, um, I'm going to slow down the metabolic rate um, just to make sure we're not wasting unnecessary energy. But that doesn't happen until someone's lost a considerable amount of body weight. So um, 
and it, it, it's pretty minor. So I do have, I have an extensive amount of writing on that on my website. So if you head over to askgeorgie.com, um, we can definitely hook you up with some more details on that if you want. But the, if, you, if you just want the nuts and bolts, your metabolism will not slow down if you don't eat between meals. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, Georgie, should, should we have people, um, and, and actually, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to do it. Um, can everyone just type into the box which habit they're going to start with next week? Oh, I love it. Great idea. So, so everyone picks one. Okay, here's me just checking to see what else I put on my <laughs> presentation here. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. Uh, so I can't see where people are typing in, Josh. So you're gonna have to relay the info to me. Um, a lot of people are okay. So people are saying journaling, journaling three to four times a day, three to four times a day, no snacking, no bites in between, three to four meals in between, <laughs> not uh, feeling hungry before eating, journaling, no snacks, three to four. Not snacking, feeling hungry before eating, waiting 30 to 60 minutes before eating. Um, I love how they're different ways. Like we can tell people are customizing. I, I do too. That's so love great. It. <laughs> I'll see you customize it right after. Um, oh. Drinking water, feeling hungry, stopping at satisfied, feeling hungry before eating, journaling, stop my snacking, exercising regularly, keeping journaling. Awesome. Oh man, you guys are so good. It, it just keeps going. <laughs> awesome. The, the uh, amount of habit practicers on, on the worldwide scale just went up by about 100. <laughs> I know, this is awesome. Oh, I so totally love that. Should, so, we, go should we have some Goldilocks it also? I, I kind of want to have some Goldilocks it. Yeah, do it. Rock it. Okay, so, so if you remember Goldilocksing, it's you know, we're, we're looking at essentially like the scale and frequency of the habit. So if it's feeling hungry before eating, you could say, I'm going to make sure I feel hungry before eating lunch, or I'm going to feel hungry before eating dinner, or I'm going to feel hungry before eating lunches and dinners during the week or whatever. If it was journaling, it could be like, I'm going to journal Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, or I'm going to journal dinners. So essentially you're, you're picking how much of the habit you want to take on, right? Kind of like we said before, you're not going to take on every single meal of the week because that would be like trying to squat 300 pounds the first time. Yeah. So, In a perfect world, um, we'd all do every meal every day, but this is the real world. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is where we like to coach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, next, next level, if, if everyone could type in, um, what, like either which meals or which days, basically, when are you going to practice that habit that you just typed in? When are you going to practice it next week? Which meals, how much, which days, yeah. how, how much and how often? Yeah. This one's a lot harder to read because it's longer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Dinner every work day, three, dinner, 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 dinner. Dinner is a popular one. It's, that it, is, I love that because for most people, that's the most challenging one, but it's also the one where people get the most leverage from change. You know, most of us are doing all right before 10 a.m. You know, it's like <laughs> breakfast, pretty routine, pretty healthy. Um, dinner, I think, is, is the bravest place to start for a lot of people. So that's a great place to put your efforts. Totally agree. All right. You aren't ready awesome. to move on? Yeah. Should, should we ask if there's any questions or should we try and jam through the last few slides and then after ask if there's any questions? Well, you just asked him, is there any questions, right? <laughs> Go ahead, type them in, guys. Uh, again, I can't read them, so hopefully our uh, hosts will be able to relay them to us. Sure. I was asking because I will. saw yeah. some we missed before. Okay. Yeah, I think we're, all, okay, we're cool. all caught up. Let's, in yeah, let, let's, let's jam. Awesome. So after you do that first one, you know, there's lots of other stuff to do. I've thrown some on this slide. Um, you're also going to have plenty of ideas from uh, 
I'm, I'm sure they'll make the slides available, so you can you can take a peek at, at other stuff here. Um, how to keep track. So you've got your first habit, you've Goldilocks it. There's basically two ways that you can decide to keep track. So one of them is simpler, and that's just only track the one habit that you're working on. So the alternative to that would be, you know, you track the first habit for two weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you add your second habit. And, and I say two weeks, just give or take, you know, some people find they want to move on faster or give it a bit more time. And then when you add the second habit, you track them both. So that would be cumulative tracking. So for the first week, it looks the same no matter what you're going to do, because you only have one habit. But then when you add the second habit, you track your first habit and your second habit. And then when you add the third habit, you track all three of those habits. So it's only adding one new one at a time, but you continue to make sure that you're uh, can, um, consistently practicing your earlier habits. So there's pros and cons to each one. With my clients, I, I tend to go for the cumulative tracking as much as we can because it tends to be more effective for weight loss. Sometimes you can end up spinning your wheels a bit if let's say you practice you know, feeling hunger before eating for two weeks and it starts to get easy. And so then you say, okay, I'm just gonna add in vegetables, um, but I'm gonna single track just that vegetable habit and not keep tracking the first habit. We well, may find that in a few days you're eating lots of vegetables, but you're eating when you're not hungry again. So, um, so I encourage cumulative tracking if you feel like you can do that. Uh, this is an example of what a tracker looks like if somebody's going to do the single tracking route. It's less overwhelming. So um, that's nice, right? You know, <laughs> we always like simple. <laughs> when we do cumulative habit tracking, it looks like this. This is an actual client spreadsheet. Um, so you can see at the beginning, she has you know practice feeling hunger for 30 to 60 minutes. She, I see my clients every two weeks, so it's, it's like clockwork. Um, so you can see we kept that habit when we moved to January 5th and then added the second habit. She was ready to start paying attention to her fullness during meals and stop if she noticed that she was satisfied or oops, I'm already past satisfied. And then you can see um, a while after that, it actually looks like, you know, we went eight weeks or sorry, four weeks on that first habit or so. Um, so down on February 2nd, you can see we decided, all right, we still got the original 30 to 60 minutes of hunger. We reworded the second habit. She was gonna stop it comfortable because she was so ready that she was confident she was just done eating past satisfied. So she was Goldilocks to that one to be stop at comfortably satisfied. And in her words, that was feeling good, but not heavy. And then she added in a third one, which was to meditate. And so, and so on and so forth. You can see later in February, we added eating slowly. And you know, this is how a person becomes a automatically healthy lean person, one habit at a time with a bunch of practice. Anything to add on that one, Josh? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to throw in that um, we we split the habits up into a lot of different focus points, but but to me, they kind of all occur like they're they're part of like larger families of habits. Like there's a lot of habits that fit into eating just enough and there's a lot of habits that fit into kind of like planning and, and logistics around food. And um, and so what's cool is that you know habits can sort of be combined or they're sort of working on the same things in different ways and so it uh they they really 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 can work together in cool um synergistic ways i just um always make sure that people are spending like 90 percent of their energy on the the newest habit yeah yeah the, the, it does happen sometimes where people will add habits too quickly and then they discover that they're they're less than 50 percent on the x's and we say okay we got to cut back let's let's circle back and cut you know reduce the number and go back to just working on two to make sure we get a high consistency with them so um, we have a couple oh. people um cody bishop um wanted to say something i unmuted you cody and um josh our ceo also wanted to say a few things as we're wrapping up tonight rad hey, hey cody guys. hey what's up guys What's up? <laughs> hey, no, Josh, uh, Josh and Georgia, you guys are doing fantastic. You guys uh, keep rolling, and I just want to say a couple of things uh, once you guys once you guys wrap it up. For sure. What are we gonna say? No, it's your webinar. 
<laughs> of course. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Of course. Yeah, I, I think we're there. I, I think we're at the wrap up. Yeah, we pretty um, much are. This is just the point where we have to mention, hey, we have books. If you want to read more stuff by us, they're available. Um, we also have free Facebook groups because we love helping people. This is not about selling stuff, trust me. Um, so we'd love to hear from you. Our email addresses are there. Don't hesitate to use them. Um, yeah, I just, I get so excited talking about this stuff. Having a great time. Yeah, this is fun. Thanks, guys. Yeah, what's going on, Cody? No, no, you, you, yeah, this is Josh and Cody both over here. You, you guys, you guys got me jacked up. That was amazing. That was so awesome. <laughs> was, uh, you, you two are just super impressive. You line up with what we believe in so much. You know, a lot of what you guys talked about, we call it sliding right. You know, you don't knock it all out in one, one, one thing. It's just you try to slide right towards your goal a little every day. And what you guys said was awesome. Uh, and I just want to, you know, tell the Delta Life community, hey, what do you guys think? Do you guys want to see more of this habits-based stuff built into the program uh, and have us bring more of what Josh and Georgie were talking about to the Delta Life program? Let us know. Send, uh, send in to Heather and Nicole and let them know if you want to see more of this kind of stuff. I can't thank you guys enough for taking the time to one, build the slide deck, and then two, just taking the time to come out tonight. And I, I know you guys do it just from a place of love and wanting to help people. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come out here and, and help all these Delta ladies. We sure appreciate it. I'm so glad we got to meet you guys and, and all the people out there. And I hope we hear from you. Yeah, this was super fun. Thanks for having us on. And thanks everyone that typed in questions and typed in their habits and how they're Goldilocksing them. Thanks everyone for, for participating. Thanks for investing in you, showing up, taking the hour out of your day and treating yourself well. Love it. Thank you, guys. Yeah. I'm, I'm super looking forward to uh, connecting with you guys at Delta Life World Con in June in New Orleans. So I can't wait to uh, see you guys there. Can't wait. Thank you. Awesome. We can't either. Good night. Thanks. This webinar was brought to you by Delta Life Fitness. If you'd like to learn more about Delta Life Fitness, visit www.deltalifefitness.com.